I'm Rod Rourke, and I'd like to welcome you to this edition of the PRS Journal Club podcast with your hosts, Drs. Jordan Fry, Chad Parnell, and Dr. Chuja Shafkat. Please enjoy. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the April 2017 edition of the PRS Journal Club podcast. My name is Shuja Shafkat, PRS resident ambassador from Lehigh Valley. And as always, I'm joined by my co-resident ambassadors, Jordan Fry from NYU and Chad Parnell from Northwestern. Today, we have the privilege of being joined by Dr. Hani Spatani, Assistant Professor of Plastic Surgery at the University of California, San Francisco. Thank you very much, Dr. Spatani, for joining us for this PRS Journal Club podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. The article we'll be discussing next is called A Temporoparietal Fascia Pocket Method for Elevation of a Reconstructed Oracle for Microtia by Drs. Kurabayashi, Asado, Suzuki, Kaji, and Matoma from the Dokyo Medical University in Japan. Just for everyone to remember, all these months' articles can be read for free on prsjournal.com, including an archive of all the past Journal Club articles. So during microtia reconstruction, as we know, sometimes obtaining good soft tissue coverage over the cartilage constructs that we make can be challenging, especially when we go back in the second stage to elevate their framework. The authors of this paper developed a specific technique that they called the TPF pocket method where the cartilage block used to elevate their construct is being placed in a pocket in the temporoparietal fascia instead of, quote, burning the bridge by using an axial standard TPF flap. Therefore, the authors chose any patient undergoing microtia reconstruction that they determined had a good volume of temporoparietal fascia, specifically excluding patients who were syndromic and any patients who are not going to have middle ear surgery since this requires elevation of a TPF flap. So what they did was elevate the auricle superficial to the temporoparietal fascia. They then made a horizontal incision and created a pocket between the capsule and the cartilage laterally and the TPF and the pericranium medially. They then inserted their cartilage block in that pocket, fixed it in place, and then closed the pocket over that block and placed a split thickness skin graft with a bolster over the back. Then I had to go back and review my trigonometry as the authors explained a very sophisticated but creative way of measuring the sulcus angle from profile pictures and how they calculated any change in the rotation from the profile pictures and then how they validated that formula from 3D CT head images. Basically, to boil it down a little bit, the postauricular sulcus angles were calculated by the change in the width of the ear on the profile pictures and looking at the inverse cosine of that, and then they added correction angles to account for changes in rotation of the pictures. They then compared their projection angles between the axial standard TPF flaps and their TPF pocket method. So all in all, they looked at 27 ears that underwent elevation with an axial TPF flap and 27 ears that were elevated with the TPF pocket method, none of which had a good amount of complications. They then noted at short term, around five to six months, the average projection with the axial TPF flap was 25 plus or minus eight degrees, and for the TPF pocket method was 28 plus or minus nine degrees. In long-term follow-up, which is about three to five years on average, the projection of the axial TPF flap was 23 plus or minus eight degrees, and for the TPF pocket method, it held up at around 28 plus or minus 11 degrees. There was no statistical difference in projection between the elevation methods and the follow-up times. However, they state since the TPF pocket method had a longer follow-up time, that could indicate that the method had better long-term stability. Overall, they had good projection of their constructs and long-term stability in cases without complications undergoing the TPF pocket method. So in the discussion, the authors provided their rationale for this less invasive technique, mainly avoiding a large incision in the hair-bearing scalp, leaving the standard axial TPF flap for secondary reconstructions if there were any complications, and that they had comparable projection to the standard TPF flap and possibly increased durability of their results. One interesting point that they brought up is that even as the skin graft contracts over time, that their auricular projection held up, and they stated that they believed that this was either due to less TPF contraction because there was less overall vascular damage to the covering of their cartilage block, or that the skin graft contraction actually pushes the cartilage blocks anteriorly, though the secondary theory would occur in both techniques, whether an axial TPF flap or the pocket method. 
They do note limited usefulness of this technique in patients without enough temporoparietal fascia like Treacher Collins, Golden Haar, hemifacial microsomia, where an axial TPF flap might be more useful, and that their estimation of projection angle and correction method obviously have some sort of risk of deviation from what might be true. So overall, I thought this was a very interesting article. There's definitely a lot of complexity in their measurements and their correction methods, but I think that that specific calculation allowed them to retrospectively review their results and increase their observed patient population rather than looking at it prospectively. I do wonder if the results would change at all if the angles were measured prospectively using a more standard measuring device or even if their pictures were more standardized rather than calculating it retrospectively, correcting for rotation. With that, Dr. Spatani, I'd be curious what you thought of this article. I have to say I really enjoyed reading this article because I think the authors did two specific things very well here. And I think this is a good lesson for anyone, even the majority of us who don't routinely perform these operations in our practice. Number one, the amount of thought and planning that went into this technique by the authors, I think was, if anything, inspirational. I mean, you mentioned already the fact that they're using complex algebra and really intricate measurements for calculating the various auricular angles in their reconstruction. And I think it just really is something that can be translated for any of us, whether we do microsurgery, whether we do head and neck reconstruction, you know, no matter what our specialty is, hand surgery, I think it's really interesting to read the amount of thought and the amount of planning that went into these operations by these authors. And it was really a learning experience for me just to see how much they were putting into it. And number two, I really commend them because they've taken this operation that has classically been done in one of two ways, whether you follow kind of the Brent techniques or the Nagata techniques, and they've taken it and they've really tried to make it a more minimally invasive technique by avoiding the need to fully raise the TPF flap. And whether that translates to better overall and long-term outcomes remains to be seen. But I think the general concept of trying to take a multi-stage procedure and make it more minimally invasive kind of goes in line with everything we're always trying to do in reconstructive surgery. So I really commend them on those two things. And I think it made reading this paper really fascinating. I agree. I think that trying to keep it minimally invasive was great, especially in the pediatric population. And I specifically thought that the authors brought up an interesting point. I want to hear your take on this about preserving the vascularity of the temporoparietal fascia flap. So they specifically said that they like to keep that bailout option if there's a complication or for secondary reconstruction and not burning the bridge of using the standard axial TPF fascia flap. And preserving the vascularity of that flap may be leading to less contraction over time and why their angles may be held up over a longer period of time than the standard method. So even though the standard axial TPF flap is pretty vascular overall, what's your opinion about that statement? Do you agree? Do you disagree? That's a statement that I think is probably not entirely true, I have to say. I think Certainly, if they avoid the need to raise the temporoparietal fascia flap, by definition, they're maintaining all of its vascularity. However, we know that if you raise the TPF flap as an axial flap and you know for sure that you've maintained the length of the posterior branches from the superficial temporal artery and vein, by making it an axial flap in that manner, I don't think you're really reducing the vascularity of that fascia. I think you're, if anything, maintaining it to its preoperative situation. And so I'm hard pressed to really believe that by not elevating it, they're maintaining any more vascularity than they would have been if they were raising a truly axial TPF flap. So that's one claim that I think probably doesn't fully stand in this paper. Great, thank you. Chad, what did you think of this paper? I have to admit, some of the math was challenging, and I, I did have to go through some mental gymnastics in order to really fully understand some of these ways that they were looking at these angles. But I think that anyone who's done microtia work can say that the soft tissue envelope is a major problem, especially in that posterior sulcus. And so I thought this was a really creative way to get that area covered that doesn't burn a lot of bridges. 
So this is something that if you have the technical ability to do this and you have a clean field, this is something that I think in my future practice, I would give it a try at least. And so kind of in that vein, I want to know, Dr. Spatani, would you consider using this method or this pocket whenever you're reconstructing adult patients, either from trauma or from oncologic problems where they've lost part of their ear? I absolutely would consider this technique, and I think I would consider it for the reasons that we've already mentioned. Number one, the authors have clearly shown that they can get a reliable reconstruction with maintained projection and aesthetics over time using this TPF pocket technique. And even more importantly, in the adult trauma population, again, I think the reason to use this technique would be to the fact that you're preserving the axial TPF flap as a backup in the future in case you have a breakdown. And I think in that population, it's even more important to have a backup plan or a plan B. And so to answer your question, yeah, I would absolutely consider this technique mainly for those reasons, because you're not burning the bridge of losing an axial TPF flap. And so in the instance that those patients need additional reconstructive or revisionary procedures, you still have that option available. Great. Yeah. I'm, I'm waiting for my first patient where I can try it. <laughs> Soon enough. Jordan, what did you think of this paper? I echo what's been said. I think it was very commendable effort by the authors, obviously, to think of this procedure and think what they could be doing better and trying to get better outcomes and improving upon the classic techniques. The one thing that stuck out to me, and they were very honest about this in the paper, is that they had a relatively higher rate of complications, including notably infection, compared to what's kind of traditionally reported in the literature. I think just for residents to understand, it can be kind of a gray area and tricky situation when you have a young kid or adolescent coming in who had a microtia repair and has an infection. In what cases you attempt salvage and in what cases you kind of have to bite the bullet and remove the construct and live to fight another day. What are your thoughts on this, Dr. Spatani? I would agree with you. I mean, to be totally honest, this is one setting where I don't have a ton of experience and... If anything, the reason I like doing these resident podcasts is that you guys are a lot closer to these procedures than I am at this point. So if anything, I would ask your two colleagues to comment on their thoughts of this, because you guys are doing this on a daily basis, certainly this procedure much more than I am. Chad Shuja, what have you seen being done? It's a tough question, and, and clearly there are only a few people who have a lot of microtia experience out there that can look at a cartilage construct and say, I'm going to try and save that versus I'm going to try and just take everything out and fight another day. But I think in general, what I've seen is it partially has to do with soft tissue coverage and how extreme of coverage you're going to have to use in order to deal with your soft tissue problem. So if a patient's already had their TPF burned and all their local options are gone and now they have another infection and cartilage exposure and you're talking about doing some sort of like a serratus fascia free flap in order to cover that, sometimes it's just better to say, hey, this is, a, you know, we've got an infected construct and we're going to burn our absolute, you know, sort of Cadillac reconstructive option in this area. Maybe we should wait until we've got a totally clean field and use that free flap to cover a new perfect construct. So I think partially it has to do with how bad the infection is. So the worse the infection, the less likely that you're going to be able to salvage things. And then also your local soft tissue options. The more difficult your soft tissue coverage, the more likely that you're going to say, maybe we should wait and get rid of our construct. I will add one thing. I think those are great responses. And again, I think those are situations that you guys probably in your training now see fairly routinely. In my mind, especially when you're talking about operations that involve bone or cartilage, as this one does, probably I think the main distinction that needs to be made is the one between a soft tissue or skin infection versus an underlying deeper in this situation, incidence of chondritis. Because I think if you're going to deal with a patient that's developed a separative chondritis, then I think that becomes a much more difficult issue to treat and overcome and probably one that needs to be treated by removing everything and restarting. So if they have edema, redness, tenderness that indicates that chondritis might be involved, then it's probably less advisable to be aggressive and try to overcome that infection since it's less likely. Shu, did you have a last question there? 
Yeah, I kind of agree with what Chad said. I mean, there's not a lot of people who have a vast experience in doing these. And I think that trying to be a little riskier with trying to salvage these using different techniques that might not be common is something that's better left for experts. So I've always been taught, and we don't do a lot of these, but I've always been taught to not burn bridges if you don't have to, which kind of speaks to the whole point of the paper. If you don't need to burn the bridge or you can start again in a clean field, that's kind of what I've been taught in my training. I think with that, we'll end our discussion of this article. Remember to tune in to the other two articles we'll be discussing on this month's podcast, as well as all our previous and future podcasts broadcast every month. Also, don't forget to participate in our monthly hashtag PRS Journal Club on Twitter, where we'll be able to interact directly with this month's selected articles authors. And once again, thank you very much, Dr. Spitani, for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed this discussion. Thank you.